Uh, so thank you everyone for coming along tonight. Um, this is going to be kind of a, a whistle stop tour um, of the Our D Estuary project, because um, it's quite a, a large project. We're um, hosted by Cheshire Wildlife Trust, uh, but they are one of eight um, of our core partners. And I'll get on to how the partnership works uh, in a little bit. Um, but as uh, both uh, as Helen mentioned, we are a cross-border partnership project. So we work on both the English and the Welsh sides of the DS3. Um, and that makes sense for a lot of reasons. A, how the estuary kind of should operate um, as, a, as a water body, but also in terms of looking after the wildlife and the habitats um, that we find there. Hopefully, there we go. So um, this very complicated map um, is basically our, our project area. So um, the de estuary is kind of this bit here and it's it's depicted at low tide. So the yellow is um, is all the kind of sand banks and the mud flats. Um, and the orange line down the middle, that's the cross, uh, that's the, the country border. So that's the division between England and Wales. And as you can see, it goes right down the middle of the estuary. So for a very long time, the estuary was managed as almost two separate water bodies. So the Welsh side and the English side were managed very differently. Um, and uh, our partnership um, is, is kind of coming together to, to try and change that a little bit. The blue um, areas that are numbered, um, they're our focus areas. So as you can see, our project area is really quite large. It's Chester and the surrounding villages all the way up to the top of the estuary. So on the left-hand side here, you've got Point of Air and Talacra Beach. And then on the right-hand side, you've got Hoy Lake up that way. So it's a really large area. So we chose these focus areas um, for the different elements of our project, um, but that doesn't mean that um, that we're kind of ignoring the rest of it. Um, it just means that that's where kind of we'll be conducting most of our activities and events and things like that. Um, but anyone kind of living within the, the project area, but even on, on the outskirts of the project um, is welcome to get involved. And, um, and we want um, as many members of the, the local community to get involved as possible. And we'll get onto that in a little while. So that's our project area. So the, the estuary is tidal, visibly tidal, up until the weir in Chester city centre. Um, and, and so this is kind of our catchment partnership area. And then from the weir further up towards the mouth, uh, towards the, the start of the River Dee in, in Bala in Wales, um, that's the Middle Dee catchment partnership. So there's two catchment partnerships that look after kind of the Dee, the River Dee and the Dee estuary. Um, in combination with each other. So the project uh, and the estuary. So again, this is a, a kind of another version of the map. You can see the, um, the uh, country border down the middle. Um, and you can see how narrow um, the, the river becomes here and or the estuary becomes here. And that's because this part of the estuary, so between Connors Key, and Chester or between kind of Connors Key and Queensbury uh, has been canalized. So it's been straightened. Um, and that um, area is actually really fascinating to us and really important to us because it's one of the few area um, places in, in the UK where you can see a bore wave. So that's when the water from the river um, flowing uh, from Chester into the estuary comes in contact with the tidal sea water coming in um, and it creates this kind of wave that appears to be going backwards um, and so or kind of a wave going upstream rather than downstream um, and it's quite a fascinating thing to witness so if you want to know more about the bore wave um, then please feel free to ask me any questions about that at the end um, but that's the area where you're going to see it because it's so it's so straight and it's so narrow um, that the wave, the bore wave, when the, the high tide is, is at the right level is really quite visible and it's quite spectacular if you get to see it. So why do we want to work in the de estuary? As Helen said, we're really lucky. We're between, we're kind of, we've got these two amazing kind of water bodies and, and, and estuaries. We've got the, the Mersey estuary and the de estuary. 
Um, and both of them have a lot of um, uh, really significant kind of wildlife and habitats, but the D estuary in particular has a lot of um, what we call designation. So um, all four of these uh, conservation designations apply to the D estuary. So you might have heard the term triple SI before, site of special scientific interest. Uh, so the D estuary, the whole of the estuary is a, a triple SI. Um, so, uh, and that is a, a UK designation. So that is uh, designated by um, uh, Natural England um, and they control uh, the rules and regulations around triple SI. Uh, it's also um, an SPA. So that is um, a, an EU uh, designation related to marine areas. Um, so that's um, the, the triple SI can include areas kind of on the coast and on land. The SPA is more to do with the marine uh, habitats. Um, SAC, Special Area of Conservation, again, that's another EU um, uh, designation or directive. Uh, and again, applies more to the marine areas um, of the estuary. And then Ramsar. Um, Ramsar is actually um, a UN um, designation. So it's linked to, um, to COP. And, um, and so you have Ramsar sites all over the world. And we're quite lucky here in the UK, we have a number of Ramsar sites. Um, but unfortunately, we also have a fifth designation um, or a fifth kind of um, label that we're not very pleased about. And that is the Montreux record. So the Montreux record is essentially um, the naughty list of Ramsar sites. So Ramsar is a wetland designation. It's linked to um, globally important wetlands around the world. So we are a Ramsar site. But the minute we became a Ramsar site, we also got put on the Montreux record. So we were put on the Montreux record in 1990. I say we, the D estuary, was put on the Montreux record in 1990. Uh, and uh, we are yet to be removed from that record. Um, so Montreux is a list of um, Ramsar wetlands that are at risk um, of either not being wetlands or anymore or kind of significant damage to the wetland habitat. So um, we would really love as a as a project to at least uh, start the process of getting the de estuary taken off the Mont Montreux record. Um, however, that is a, a significant process um, and requires support from lots of different groups and organizations and also both of the governments, the UK government and the Welsh government. So um, it's unlikely we'll be able to do it in the time we have, um, but we would like to at least start the process and, and um, contribute to, to improving the wetlands to the point where we can be removed, the estuary can be removed from the Montreux record. So what makes the D estuary special? Um, it's home to a number of rare coastal species. So this is um, a picture of a natterjack toad. Um, some of you may be familiar with this species if you um, do live uh, around the D estuary, um, particularly on the Welsh side up uh, in Talacra and Gronant um, on the Welsh coast. Um, there's a really healthy population of, of natterjack toads um, and uh, from kind of late April all the way through to, to um, end of June, you can hear the males calling of a night time and the natterjack toad gets its name from, um, from that call. Um, so the males make a really loud call that sounds like they're saying natterjack. Um, and the way you can identify a natterjack toad um, compared with a common toad is this beautiful bright yellow stripe that you get down the center. So that's a real defining feature of natterjack toads, particularly if they're sitting still, um, because the other thing, the other name they're known by is the walking toad, um, because they don't hop, they walk or crawl. Um, and so if you see one moving, um, and it's kind of walking or moving quite slowly, and it's got that yellow stripe, then it's going to be an adder jack toad. 
There is one final way of identifying them and that's the color of their eye. Uh, but that's a bit more challenging because they're nocturnal. So um, you don't really see them during the day. Um, but they're a threatened species. They also reside um, in at Red Rocks Nature Reserve, which is um, a, a coastal nature reserve, which is managed by Cheshire Wildlife Trust, our host partner. Um, and so we do a lot of, as project staff, we do a lot of work at Red Rocks um, to manage the breeding pools that are there um, and to monitor the toads as well. So we're really hoping for a good breeding season at Red Rocks this year. Um, and we know so far that there's been um, a lot of spawn strings laid um, on the Welsh side as well. So the Welsh population seem to be um, breeding really well this year. So the other thing um, that the UD estuary is famous for, if you're into your birds and particularly your waders and wildfowl, um, is the number of um, birds that inhabit um, the estuary, particularly over winter. Um, so it's been estimated that there's between 120 and 150,000 birds, uh, wading birds that overwinter on the estuary every year. Um, and the reason why they come to the D estuary is because there's just so much food there for them. So um, the uh, one of the my most kind of favourite species that I now work with um, as part of this project is the common cockle. Um, and that's why the birds come, because we have um, such a large um, population of cockle in the estuary. Uh, in 2021, uh, the Natural Resources Wales Cockle Survey estimated that there was over 10,000 tonnes of cockles in the estuary that year. Um, and uh, Natural Resources Wales, they manage the, um, the cockle fishery. So there's 54 licence holders. And, um, and they manage how much those fishermen can extract, how many cockles, how many kilograms of cockles they can take. Um, and in 2021, the fishermen extracted two and a half thousand tons of cockles from the estuary, but that left um, uh, 7,500 tons for the, for the birds. Um, and particularly the oyster catchers, the oyster catchers love cockles, it's their primary food. Um, so, if you're um, kind of, if you like getting out and about in the winter time, um, the estuary is a great place to go and have a, a, a nice brisk winter walk and, and watch the waders um, feeding on the estuary. It's quite amazing. Um, also, as a side note, if you uh, watched the latest David Attenborough series, Wild Isles, um, on the, um, I think it was the Source to Sea episode, they featured some um, flocks of knot, um, small wading bird, um, K-N-O-T, knots, um, and they um, being chased by a peregrine falcon. Um, and that was actually filmed at Thurstiston on the D-Estuary. So uh, the D-Estuary made it onto a David Attenborough um, documentary, which we were incredibly excited about. Uh, onto a... Uh, a slightly different bird. Um, so we have two colonies of little terns breeding on the Welsh side of the estuary. Um, and it's right in the middle of their breeding season now. So um, now is a good time um, to go and see them if you'd like to. Um, so the larger colony is found at Gronant, um, Gronant Dunes. Um, and that colony has been established for quite a while. Uh, but then in 2017, a few individuals from that colony made their way a bit further up the Welsh coast to, um, to the uh, Point of Air, um, right at the very top. Uh, and that colony uh, last year um, did really, really well uh, uh, 69 chicks um, they reared last year, that point of air colony. So 40 plus breeding pairs um, are now residing there um, every year. Uh, and so that's really exciting because the point of air colony is actually, um, uh, it's, it appears to be um, in a better position in terms of climate change and sea level rise. So it should be in a better position um, to, to remain established there. Um, the Gronach colony is a bit further down the beach and a bit closer to the 
um, the tide line. So the point of air colony, we are expecting that to grow um, quite significantly. The DF tree is also a stronghold for the common tern. Uh, and this is a slightly more unique location. And that's because the common terns have found a home in the Tartar Steel um, Industrial Estate. So Tartar Steel um, are located in Shotton uh, on the Welsh side of the estuary. And they had a, a lake that was used for managing industrial waste. So it was used for managing chemical waste. Um, byproducts of, of the manufacture of different products at the, at the Tata steel plant. Um, it's no longer used for that, so it was turned into, um, into a kind of wildlife haven and a, and a, a wetland um, and given over to uh, the common tern. So now um, it's the largest, uh, one of the largest common tern uh, colonies in Wales. Um, and it is managed by a group of volunteers along with um, some staff from, from Tata Steel. Uh, and so um, every year the common terns fly in and they breed on, um, on these little, uh, I say little, on these very large platforms that have been built for them um, to nest on. And they're covered in shingle because that's what um, the, the terns like to nest on. So um, again, they've arrived um, in, in very healthy numbers this year. So we're looking forward to seeing how many chicks um, they raise uh, there at the Tata steel plant. We also have um, some of the last remnants of, of um, uh, sand dunes in the area as well. So this is uh, Talakra, so that's the point of air lighthouse that you can see there. Um, and the dunes um, from kind of Gronin all the way up to, to point of air are a really significant habitat for a lot of, of animals. Um, things like sand lizard, um, the natterjack toads that I was talking about earlier, um, but also things like the grayling butterfly. So the grayling butterfly is the UK's largest brown butterfly. Um, it's very well camouflaged. It's very hard to find um, graylings unless they're kind of um, unless they kind of fly at you. Um, they're they're very hard to ID um, to identify, uh, but. Uh, we study them and we monitor them both on the Welsh and the English side because they're also present um, in the sand dunes at Red Rocks as well. So we also have a significant expanse of salt marsh. If you've been um, anywhere near the Deestra, you've probably seen kind of the wide expanses of, of the salt marsh. Um, and one of the interesting things about the salt marsh on the estuary is that um, there's a, a very distinct um, difference between the salt marsh that is um, grazed. So uh, a lot of it on the English side is grazed by sheep. Uh, so it's um, owned by the RSPB uh, and their headquarters are at Burton Mere, um, but it's um, owned by them and then leased out to farmers to be grazed. Whereas on the Welsh side, a lot of the salt marsh has never been grazed and so one of the interesting things that we're looking at at, at the moment is the different plant uh, makeup of plant species in, in the different areas of salt marsh and what that can tell us about um, how that salt marsh is going to fare during uh, climate change and things like that. Um, and also kind of uh, what the biodiversity um, differences are between the two areas of salt marsh. And then finally, um, new coastal habitats and rare salt marsh plants are returning. So um, this is an aerial picture of Red Rocks uh, Nature Reserve. So you can see um, here these patches of water. They're our Natterjack toad pools, our breeding pools. So they are man-made. Um, they were dug out um, and they're, they're different ages and kind of different levels of succession as well at the moment. So, um, but we have to manage those and, and cut the reeds out and, and keep them really nice and clear for the toads. Um, Natterjack toads are quite fussy about where they'll breed, so we need to keep those in tip-top condition. Um, but this is the area kind of where you can walk along. But you can also see kind of along this stretch here, um, this is where the, the embryonic dunes are starting to form. So red rocks is changing and will continue to change. Um, and hopefully, eventually, might even get to a point where um, where Gronit Dunes is, where you've got really well-established um, sand dune habitat, 
with different ages of dunes um, and the dune slacks as well. So dune slacks are the, the dip in between the dunes and, and that's where you want that clear expanse of, of sand where animals can sunbathe um, and uh, kind of the mining bees can, can get into the sand and, and breed in the spring. Um, and the bare sand is also a favorite place um, for the grayling butterflies to, to, um, to sunbathe. And then finally, the, the rare plants um, I mentioned are, are returning as well. So this is Spartina grass. Um, and so this is a really um, important um, coastal uh, plant species. Um, it's, it's an early colonizer as well. So it's really good to see this coming back because it means that hopefully other coastal plant species will establish themselves. Um, and it's actually very appropriate that um, Helen is here uh, this evening um, to help uh, host uh, this talk because uh, I recently caught up with Helen um, at our Red Rocks Nature Reserve where um, we uh, met up with the, the uh, nursery team at Chester Zoo and we planted some sea holly plants that they've been um, growing on for us. So they grew sea holly plants for us from seed and we planted the little seedlings uh, a few weeks ago uh, and that sea holly um, will be the primary food plant for the grayling butterfly so we're hoping that the more sea holly we plant the bigger the grayling butterfly population will get. So what do we love about the estuary? We love its beauty, we love its vastness when you kind of look over the estuary at low tide and all you see are those bare what appear to be bare mud flats but the amount of life that is underneath that mud and that sand is phenomenal. Uh, we know it's an important place to enjoy the benefits of nature. So there's loads of, there's the Wales coast path for walking, there's the Wirral Way for walking, there's Thurstiston Country Park, which is the oldest country park in the UK. It's 50 years old this year. Um, you know, there's, lo there's Flint Castle, there's amazing history and heritage um, for us to get out and enjoy on the DS Street. And it's also going to play a really major role in mitigating the effects of climate change, particularly over the next few years. But there's some problems. So recreational disturbance. Um, unfortunately, um, there are some people who aren't using the estuary um, in, a, in a respectful way to others and to the wildlife. So um, it's about educating people on um, the best ways to get out and enjoy the estuary um, and share the space side by side with the wildlife and other visitors. Uh, water pollution is a big problem. Um, you will have seen uh, water pollution um, as an issue in the media um, over the last few months uh, and the de estuary is no different. So we are working um, with the statutory bodies, Natural Resources Wales and the Environment Agency, Natural England, as well as the local water companies, Welsh Water and United Utilities, to try and reduce the amount of pollution that's flowing directly into the estuary. Um, there's also a lack of skills and capacity for protecting wildlife. So one of the things that we want to do as a project is really encourage um, citizen science. So people getting out there and understanding the natural world around them and what they can do to help it and to monitor it for us, because um, data is, is the most useful thing for us in terms of, of creating actions, um, particularly for our partners. Uh, and we also want to work with the younger generations as well. So we have a teacher training program as part of our project. So we're gonna work with local teachers and local school children to get them out and about on the estuary. There's also um, a lack of appreciation and understanding of the wildlife significance. So as I said, you know, when you go down to the estuary, and if it's kind of a bleak winter day and the tide's out and all you see is this kind of brown sludgy muddy sand it's a bit hard to imagine the kind of life that's happening underneath um, that top layer but also what comes in on the tide um, and as I said those hundreds of thousands of birds that inhabit the estuary over winter and all of their food is is down there um, underneath that sand just waiting to be eaten. And finally, the disconnected government, governance. So I mentioned this before, the fact that it's kind of been managed as two separate waterways, the Welsh side and the English side. So we're really keen to kind of 
bring it together as one estuary. So the partnership. So as I mentioned, we're a catchment based, um, we're a catchment partnership. So catchment based um, approach is now used all over the UK to manage water bodies, um, lakes, rivers, estuaries. And it's all about this partnership approach. So our partnership is these eight core partners. So um, we've got all four local councils. We've got Flintshire, Denbyshire, Cheshire West and Chester and Wirral. Uh, so they're all the local councils within our project area. We've also got, um, as I said, the governing body. So we've got Natural England, the Environment Agency and Natural Resources Wales. And then we've got um, uh, some other conservation NGOs and landowners. So RSPB de Estuary, uh, they um, do an incredible amount of work on the de Estuary, but they're also a significant landowner on the estuary as well. So um, they own land on both the Welsh and the English sides of the estuary. Cheshire Wildlife Trust, that's our host partner. So that's who I'm based with, um, but I technically work for all eight of these organisations. And then uh, we've got uh, the North Wales Wildlife Trust as well. Um, and then the Deestuary Conservation Group, which is a, a group, um, and I think it's up to 28 now, representing 28 local and national bodies with uh, an interest in the wildlife of the Deestuary. So there's a lot of people that want to support us on this project, which is really exciting. Um, and hopefully we're stronger together and we can make a real difference um, over the next uh, kind of 18 months or so that we've got left of the project. So these are the three work streams. Um, so love my estuary, um, that's my work stream. So promoting the estuary and encouraging behavior change. Then we've got coast lives. So coast lives um, is all about the wildlife and um, encouraging people to get involved, volunteering and then training and learning. So that's linked with our um, teacher training program. And then one estuary, um, establishing a long-term and unified approach to the estuary management. So that's all about the governance of the estuary and particularly what's gonna happen at the end of our project if we don't continue past March, 2025. So this is me, love my estuary, promoting the estuary and encouraging behavior change. So um, these are kind of the, the different elements to my job, um, communicating the de-estuary, um, I'm also working, as I mentioned, on coastal recreation. So working with um, windsurfers, dog walkers, sailors, kayakers, anyone and everyone who's out there um, interacting with the de -estuary. I want to know what they love about it, what they don't like about it, what they think we could change, what they think we could make better. Um, I'm also working um, on the clean water initiative. So that's looking into um, those issues with pollution, but also talking to households about what um, they can do to reduce their impact on um, water pollution within the de estuary and accessing the estuary. So that's more about um, improving um, uh, access in terms of pathways and things like that. So this is some of the boardwalk that we installed at Gronent. Um, so it's lovely new boardwalk, non-slip non for winter time. So you can go and explore the Gronent Dunes any time of year. Um, I'm also running a really fascinating project, sub-project, which is looking at the sights and the sounds of the de-estuary. So this is one of my sound recording volunteers. Uh, I recruited six sound recording volunteers who had never recorded sound before. Um, and so I um, got them together. I worked alongside some academics from uh, a few of the local Northwest universities uh, and trained them in how to record sound. And so they're now out, um, out and about on the estuary recording the, the sounds of the de estuary for me, um, which I'll use in my communications further on down the project. And I'm also hoping to create a short film by combining the work of my photography volunteers and my um, and my uh, uh, sound recording volunteers. And then also getting the project out there. So this is our project vehicle. You might see us driving around uh, the estuary um, in our, our ranger. Um, and this was a, a filming session we did with ITV Coast and Country. So I'm um, just trying to get the project out there and all the great work that us and our partners are doing. And then lots of events, so um, lots of talks, lots of walks, um, lots of community events out on the estuary, 
um, again, to get the community involved um, and to, to answer any questions that people might have about the estuary and, and um, yeah, just teach everyone about this amazing um, habitat that we have on our doorstep. And sadly, the water pollution. So working um, with the, the water companies, but also with local communities on how we can reduce our impact on the water, um, water quality of the deer estuary. And then uh, access. So, um, and of course the, the doggos. So we love um, our dogs, they love the beach. Um, but one of the, the things that we find in winter time is that dogs um, can often disturb the feeding um, waders in, in winter because the waders follow the, the, sh the tide line. So um, we recommend that um, if you want to get out and about on the beach uh, with your dog, particularly in winter time, that you do it at low tide. So um, if it's low tide, it means the birds are far out into the estuary um, or even out at sea fishing. Um, and that means that you and your dog can enjoy the estuary um, without um, disturbing the birds. So coast lives, uh, this is focused, as I said, on volunteering um, and citizen science. So this is, is one of the key areas where you guys can get involved um, and become a citizen science with us. Uh, citizen scientists with us, sorry. Um, and uh, we also uh, run some wellbeing with nature sessions as well. So keep an eye out for our next round of wellbeing with nature sessions, which will be coming up very soon. Uh, so these are some of our citizen scientists hard at work. So this is um, actually at Red Rocks. Um, and this is looking for grayling butterfly larvae. So uh, the grayling butterfly larvae or caterpillar is nocturnal. So they only come out at nighttime. Um, and so getting out and about at nighttime um, with our torches to see if we can find some grayling butterfly larvae, because if you can find the larvae and count them, you have a good idea of um, how many adults you have breeding in the area. These are our Natajack toad pools. So this is, um, again, some of our volunteers counting spawn strings. So those stakes that they're putting in the water are to mark each individual spawn string. So by counting the spawn strings, we can estimate how many breeding female Natajack toads we have in the area. And then we monitor the spawn strings and hopefully if they're fertile, they'll turn into tadpoles and then into toadlets. And uh, we also do a lot of training um, with our partners um, as well. So uh, this is Dave Costello from uh, the Butterfly Conservation Foundation. Um, so um, Dave comes out and trains our uh, grayling butterfly surveyors um, to, to know what to look for. And then finally, we do get right out into the estuary as much as we can. And this is a shore search survey. So this is us doing core sampling on the mudflats to see what invertebrates um, and other interesting animals are living um, in the mud and in the sand on the estuary. And then finally, our teacher training. So um, training the teachers to then train the next generation um, to get out and enjoy the estuary and understand what an amazing um, uh, backdrop we have here. And then finally, one estuary. So this is about governance and legacy planning. Um, and so um, just interacting with as many different elements of the community and as many partners as we can to try and establish one estuary rather than two separate estuaries. So what we're really hoping to establish or to do as part of this project. So we're about halfway through our delivery phase at the moment where National Lottery Heritage funded, which um, we have funding for three years and we're about 18 months in. So um, we um, are, are hoping that we'll have a more and wider range of people actively caring for the estuary. So one of the, the key things we want to establish by the end of this project is that there are people like our citizen scientists and like um, our sound recording volunteers who carry on going out and interacting with the estuary after the project's finished. So we want to create that community of stewardship that will look after the estuary long into, the, into its future. We also want to, um, to create better habitats um, for coastal wildlife. So as I mentioned, we're doing a lot of work at Red Rocks 
Um, and we also want to look into what things we can achieve within the next 18 months in terms of removing um, or, or, or progressing um, the, re the removal of, of the de-estuary from the Montreux record. We also um, want people to be more aware of the global significance of the de-estuary and the ecosystem services it provides. So again, linking back to climate change and, and, and the amazing natural buffer that the estuary is. So the de-estuary has one of the largest tidal shifts of any estuary in the UK. Um, and as I mentioned, it also has that amazing bore wave, um, which if you're ever traveling around, you can also see on the Severn Estuary. The Severn Estuary has a really large bore wave that people can surf. Um, it's not, not as, as grandiose here at the de Estuary, but it's still significant. Um, and, and we really would like to get our focal species um, more well known uh, as well. So things like the, the terns, the common terns and the little terns, the grayling butterflies and the natterjack toads as well. Really get um, people interested in those species, understand what those species mean for the local habitats and the local ecosystems and how important they really are. Um, the other thing about the de estuary is it's also a, a quite significant fish nursery for lots of different fish species, including um, the very endangered lamprey. So um, it's also a really significant water body as well as the coastal habitats um, that we kind of see on a, a regular basis. And then of course we want it managed um, properly into the future. So we wanna make sure um, that it's managed in a coordinated way and that the country boundary doesn't really matter. It needs to be managed as one estuary. So the Welsh and the English partners working together. So um, as um, I mentioned, um, I'm the communications and campaigns uh, officer for the project. So I, um, I run our social media channels. So you can find us at Our de Estuary on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, if you wanna email the project, it's ourdestuary at cheshirewt.org.uk. Um, I can put all these in the chat as well in a minute. Um, and we also have a web page um, on the Cheshire Wildlife Trust website. And that web page, um, you can sign up to our e-newsletter and you can register um, to become a volunteer with us as well. <laughs>